Number 1. The Cowden Family Richard Cowden and his wife Belinda June lived together with their five-year-old son David James and their five-month-old daughter Melissa Dawn. They owned a small cozy house in the White City, Oregon. On the Labor Day weekend of 1974, the family went for a family camping trip to the Rogue River National Forest campground in the remote Siskiyou Mountains of Oregon near the border of California. They had planned to camp out until Sunday, September 1st and then stop at Belinda's mother's house for dinner before heading back home. Belinda's mother lived only about a mile away from the campground. That Sunday morning at around 9 a.m., Richard and David were seen at a general store in the nearby town of Copper, Oregon, buying some milk. It would be the last time any of the Cowden family would ever be seen alive. After waiting for her daughter and her family for hours, Belinda's mother became worried. She then decided to drive out to the campsite in order to see what was taking them so long. When she arrived, she found a quart of milk sitting on a picnic table, along with Melissa's diapers and Belinda's purse set out, as well as the family's car parked just where it belonged. The campsite in general seemed totally undisturbed, as if the family would be returning at any moment. As she walked around the campsite, she discovered both Richard's expensive wristwatch and wallet containing $23 lying on the ground by the creek. She waited about an hour for the family to return, but they never did. She eventually notified the police. Police found fishing poles laid against a tree and unused cooking utensils carefully laid out on a tree stump. The car seemed to be untouched and there was no sign of anything missing or rummaged through. There was no sign of foul play or a struggle, and indeed, the whole scene was eerily calm. Oddly, the family's swimsuits were missing, as if they had all gone out for a casual swim. These were the only things that were found to be missing from the camp, and even the wallet and purse had money and credit cards in them. The family dog was found unharmed about five miles from the camp. A massive search was launched of the area, yet no signs of the missing family could be found. Various theories were put forward at the time as to what could have happened to them. One was that they might have gone swimming and drowned, but no trace of the bodies could be found anywhere along the small creek. Another theory was that they might have disappeared willingly, but the family had no major debts or enemies and all seemed to be happy and well adjusted. Also, robbery could not have been the motive since everything was left at the campsite. Seven months went by without any explanation of their disappearance. Then, in April of 1975, two hunters came across what appeared to be human remains out in a remote forested area. Officers were quickly called to the scene and they uncovered four decomposing corpses of two adults and two children. The remains were determined to be those of the Cowden family. David and Belinda Cowden's bodies, along with that of Melissa, were found stuffed into a cave on a steep hillside about seven miles from their campsite, which had been blocked off with rocks to hide the macabre site within. The cave was only around 100 feet from an area that had been heavily searched by police at the time of the disappearances. Both David and Belinda were found to have been shot with a 22 caliber bullet, while little Melissa displayed severe blunt trauma to her head. Richard's body was not found inside the cave with the rest of his family, but several feet outside. His body was too decomposed to tell exactly how he died, although he is speculated to have been died from a gunshot. It was at first suspected that Richard Cowden had murdered his family and then committed suicide. But a thorough search of the area turned up no weapons of any kind. If Richard was indeed responsible for the deaths of his family and his own suicide, then some sort of weapon would have still been around. It was then speculated that they had met with some sort of foul play. One of the scenarios put forward by police was that they had been abducted at a gunpoint after they had gone off to swimming in the creek and then been driven some distance away, forced up the hillside 
and then chart execution style. Although no one has any idea who did it or why. Suspicion was leveled at Cowden's father because he had committed suicide shortly after the vanishings, but he would later be cleared. Later, a convicted murderer and rapist by the name of Dwayne Lee Little, who had done time for the assault and killing of a teenager in 1964 and who had been released on parole in 1974, was thought to be the killer. He was found to have been buying gas in the general vicinity of the Cowden campground shortly before their disappearance. However, there was never enough evidence to conclusively link Little to the crime. Little would eventually be arrested and convicted of an unrelated murder and rape of a woman in 1980s. Still, to this day, nobody has been arrested or charged in the Cowden family massacre. Number 2. The Sims Family On October 22, 1966, Dr. Robert Sims and his wife, Helen, were at home with their 12-year-old daughter listening to a college football game on the radio between Florida State University and Mississippi State. The Simses also had two older daughters, Jeannie and Judy, but they were babysitting for families who had gone to the game. Neither girl was expected back home until late in the evening. Around 11 p.m., Jeannie came home and found the place eerily quiet. Her parents and her little sister were in the master bedroom. All had been bound with identical carefully tied knots. Richard and Helen had been shot, while Joy had been stabbed and shot multiple times. Only Helen had survived the attack, but before she could describe what had happened, Helen fell into a coma. She died a few days later in the hospital. The Sims case led to trick or trading being cancelled in Tallahassee in 1966. Young women armed themselves with spray bottles of ammonia to protect themselves. Interestingly, although no one could think of any enemies the Sims might have had, both Robert and Helen had been blindfolded and their home showed no signs of forced entry. C.A. Roberts, a pastor known to the family, became the main suspect in the case. It was revealed that Roberts was having a series of affairs with the local women. Interestingly enough, Helen was Roberts' secretary at First Baptist Church and had mysteriously left the job a few days before her murder. Some say Roberts was making advances on her. Others say she simply knew too much about the going-ons at First Baptist Church. Roberts, however, had a solid alibi. He worked for the Florida State University football team and was seen at that day's game. A more interesting suspect came in the form of a young male neighbor. He lived in the house behind that of the victims, and investigators believed the killer entered from this direction. He was dating a young woman who was reported as being obsessed with death and was constantly getting in trouble with the local funeral homes by breaking in stealing funeral shrouds and sleeping in them and pestering the owners. She also displayed an unusual curiosity in following the investigation. However, the suspects were never questioned and the Sims murder remains unsolved. The Javidian Family Murders On May 27, 2014, US Air Force veteran Brandon Jividen, 37 years old, his girlfriend Rebecca Adams, 22 years old, her daughters Michelle and Jeraka Hunley, and their family dog suddenly went missing from their apartment in Kenai, Alaska. On May 31st, a concerned neighbor contacted police saying that they had seen no signs of the family for several days. When authorities arrived, they found their two cars parked outside and the apartment untouched and not missing anything, with no signs of forced entry or anything out of the ordinary. All their belongings, including wallets, camping gear, and a nappy bag, were all left behind. Breakfast was still on the table, as if they left in a hurry. The last person to speak to Rebecca had been her sister, Lennel Adams, who told the police she had sounded distressed. She said, Growing up, we always had this thing. We say, though shall not lie. 
and you always have to tell the truth. I asked her, Thou shall not lie, Becca. Are you okay? She said, Don't ask me that right now. Just know that I love you. Searchers scoured the area in and around the family home, which expanded to include the FBI. Aircraft and search and rescue dogs were used, but no sign of them could be found. Then, in March 2015, the remains of the family, along with the dog, were found less than a mile away from the couple's home. Also found at the scene were two handguns lying in a close proximity to Brandon's body. The condition of the remains and the guns have caused authorities to speculate that Brandon Jevedin had shot and killed his girlfriend, her kids and their dog before turning the gun on himself in a murder-suicide. Yet, there was no motive behind this, as the family was living happily together. Despite the fact that they could not ascertain any motive for the crime, police put it down to a murder-suicide plot and declared the case closed in June 2015. Number 4. Geelong Baru Family On the morning of 6th January 1979, the mutilated bodies of four children, Tan Cook Peng, Tan Cook Hin, Tan Cook Soon and their sister Tan Chin Ni were found in their housing and development board flat. That day, their parents, who operated a minibus together, left the house at approximately 6.35 am to ferry students to school, leaving their children sleeping at home. At 7.10 am, as was their daily routine, the mother made a call home to wake up the children but received no responses after three separate calls. She then asked one of her neighbors to help wake them up. The neighbor knocked on the door of their flat but also received no response. The Tans arrived home after 10 am and Miss Tan found the slashed bodies of her children in the bathroom, stacked on top of each other. The four children were found in t-shirts and pants and all four had slash wounds on their heads. Slash wounds were also found on Chin Ni's face, and Cook Pen's right arm was almost severed. Each child had almost 20 slashes on their body. There was no sign of forced entry, nor was anything missing from the flat. The CID Special Investigation Section conducted the investigation into the murders and concluded that the crime was premeditated and the killer or killers took care not to leave any evidence behind. However, there were blood stains in the kitchen sink and the killer or killers were believed to have cleaned themselves before leaving the flat. The murder weapons, believed to be a dagger and a chopper from the kitchen, could not be found. The police acknowledged that revenge could be the motivation behind the crime, but all the leads they followed turned out to be either be a dead end or a hoax. Mrs. Tan's brother told the media that the murders could have been related to an illegal Tontine scheme. But the trail did not lead to the murderer and the Tans told the police they have not made any enemies. The killers seemed to know the family intimately and the nightmare did not end there. They seemed to know that the mother had undergone a sterilization procedure sometime after the birth of her youngest child and they allegedly received a card two weeks after the Chinese New Year depicting happy children at play and a chilling message. Now you can have no more offspring, ha ha ha, and was signed the murderer in Mandarin. The sender of the card also appeared to have intimate knowledge of the family as they addressed the Tans by their nicknames. Despite interviewing over 100 of the Tan family's neighbors and public appeals for witnesses, the police had difficulties obtaining useful information. Residents in the area claimed a witness had seen Chin Ni struggling with her man from his flat in another block, but the witness could not be located. The children's parents were also questioned by the police. A witness later told Chinese newspaper he saw a couple, one of them blood-stained, leaving the scene of the murder, but police investigation later revealed it to be a hoax. One of the Tan's neighbors, 68-year-old Yam Yin Tin, said she usually sat along the common corridor to watch children playing, 
and would have seen anyone coming and going from the Tan family's flat. However, on the morning of the murders, she was washing her hair and did not see anyone entering or leaving the Tan's flat. Later, a taxi driver came forward and identified a man in his 20s who walked with a lurch had boarded a taxi near the location of the murder at about 8 am that morning. The taxi driver said that the man had blood stains on the left side of his body and carried a knife that banged against the taxi door. In a police lineup, the driver identified the man and it was found that he was the neighbor of the Tan family who visited their home to use the phone daily. He was known as uncle to the kids but after two weeks, he was released due to insufficient evidence. The man, who was Malaysian, later moved out with his sister. The children were buried at Choi Chu Kang Cemetery on 7th January 1979 together with their school bags, books and toys. The mother underwent a reversal of sterilization procedure and gave birth to a baby boy in 1983 at the age of 35. Till today, the murder was never found and the case remains unsolved. Number 5. The Nepal Royal Family In 2001, at the Narayan Hethi Royal Palace in Kathmandu, Nepal's royal family was gathered for a party. Those present included King Birendra, his wife Queen Aishwarya, his sons Crown Prince Dipendra and Prince Nirajan his daughter Princess Shruti and her husband, his nephew Prince Paras and his brother Prince Dhirendra, including a few security personnel and aides. Crown Prince Dipendra had been drinking heavily, had smoked large quantities of hashish and misbehaved with her guest, which resulted in his father King Birendra telling Dipendra, who was his oldest son, to leave the party. Crown Prince Dipendra was escorted to his room by his brother Prince Nirajan and cousin Prince Paras. But Dipendra returned some time later, dressed in fatigues and armed with an MP5, a SPAS-12 and M16. He starts shooting first at the ceiling and then at his father Birendra. When Uncle Dhirendra attempted to stop him, Dipendra shot him at point blank. He then proceeded to massacre all his family members in the room, except his mother and sister, whom he shot in the garden. After killing or wounding most present, Dipendra wandered off onto the premises of the palace and shot himself in the head which left a gaping wound which left him critically injured. Dipendra was proclaimed king while in a coma, but he died on 4th June 2001, after a three-day reign. Later, King Biren's other brother, Gyanendra, was appointed regent for the three days, then ascended the throne himself after Dipendra died. It is largely believed that the massacre was due to Dipendra being angry at his mother and father for not allowing him to marry the girl of his choice, Divyani Rana. It is also speculated that the reason for the marriage dispute over Dipendra's choice of wife was that the royal family had a position that the crown prince should not marry someone having relatives in India, as Devyani did. But most Nepali don't buy this. There is a deep-seated suspicion about the whole thing, because King Birendra and his family, who were all well-loved, all died, all of them. Dipendra is supposed to even shot his brother Nirajan and his sister Shruti, whom he was rumoured to be extremely fond of. It was surprising that the younger brother of King Birendra, Gyanendra Bikram Shah, was outside the alley when the incident occurred on the Friday night of the family gathering. Moreover, the family members on King Birendra's side were all shot down, but those on Gyanendra's side, his son Paras and wife Komal, who were present at the massacre, were unharmed in all respects. This can be a coincidence, but people still question the event. Some people also argue that Dipendra simply could not have done the shooting, as it was stated that Dipendra was drunk and had smoked a joint, and it would have been very difficult to operate a firearm accurately when you're both drunk and high. Furthermore, a huge number of guards with lethal weapons were deployed, 
and they could have easily taken down the crown prince when he started shooting, but none of them did. Also, Dipendra was in coma for three days and his regular doctor was obstructed from seeing him time and again. A new doctor was responsible for carrying out the tests and he simply declared him dead. There was no post-mortem of the body and was taken straight away for cremation. Many allege that this was done to cover up the fact that Dipendra did not shoot himself and that there were others involved. There were also rumors that the wound he died of could not have been self-inflicted. Since then, there has been numerous theories, but anyone who was there has yet to come out and say conclusively what happened. Those who did, like Kumar Gorak, the husband of Princess Shruti, who survived with a bullet wound, have stuck to the official version and given evasive interviews where things didn't quite add up. A few servants have also claimed to have seen masked men do the shooting. The leader of the Maoist party even claimed that it was raw, India's intelligent unit that orchestrated the massacre. Still, others claim that the Maoists are to blame, since back then, they were a rebel guerrilla group in the midst of an armed conflict. However, no one really knows what exactly happened that day.